everybody and welcome back to another Adobe Live. Uh, we're here today on a very hot day in the UK with Matt van der Putte. Welcome Matt to Adobe Live. Hot indeed, thanks for having me, good to be here. I'll try not to sweat too much. <laughs> I know, right? It is a hot one for sure. Uh, Matt, it's so good to have you on. Matt is a time-lapse photographer, travel filmmaker, and we've got a lot in store for you today. And Matt, we are joined by lots of familiar faces in our chat. Um, a quick hello to everybody that we have in there. Hey, Sandrine. Hi, Kirsty. Hi, Sean. Uh, Steve, I think, has joined us from New Zealand again. Hey, ora, Steve. I know. <laughs> We're waiting right? for that. I know. And then we've got Tim as well in the background, the voice of Tim. He's always here, of course, uh, managing nice. us, you know, looking after us. Um, but yeah, so we're here. We're chatting on Behance, everybody. So if you have questions for Matt today, get in touch on behance.net forward slash live. We're not chatting in the YouTube, but of course we are chatting on Behance. And we're here every day uh, from midday till 1 p.m. So, Matt, what do you have in store for us today? A lot. Um, <laughs> no, so... I was asked to do something about time lapse, or I was asked to do a live, I guess. And I was like, oh, what do I know? Uh, what can I talk about? So, time lapse photography. I hope to uh, share with you the basics of how to shoot a time lapse, um, which is difficult to show in a uh, in a stream like this. So, I'll just talk about, I guess, the ideas behind it, uh, and then I'll show you how I edit time lapses using Lightroom mainly, and then you can use either Photoshop or After Effects to create the video file because the time lapse is shot as a series of photos. Uh, to have, you know, high resolution and dynamic range, etc. So we'll use either Photoshop or After Effects to export those video files. And then depending on how much time we have, I have no idea how long I'm going to go over all that. Uh, we can talk about a bit of hyperlapse photography, which is kind of a niche within a niche, uh, which is big moving time lapses. Uh, and I'll show you some of my work. And yeah, again, depending on how much time we have, we can talk about how to monetize time-lapse photography or how to monetize uh, a creative hobby, I guess, generally. Uh, yeah. So yeah, plenty, uh, plenty of things today to talk about. It sounds good. And do you know what? I'm looking forward to seeing it you know, done in a really professional way, because when I think of time lapse, I think of it on my iPhone, mm. um, recording me and my family playing a game of bulls outside. And when you look at it all back, it looks like you're a, a moving penguin. So it's yeah. not really. <laughs> so I'm looking forward but, uh, to seeing it done, you know. A supersonic penguin, like sped up. When it's sped up. Uh, yeah. um, I, that's funny you mentioned that, like shooting on your iPhone or shooting on your phone. It's one of the key uh things i think that people get wrong about time lapse they're like why isn't it it's just sped up video isn't it like when they see this footage they think it's a video camera that's rolling that's shooting video frames at 25 or 30 frames a second and then you condense that but this is a great intro because i could talk straight away about why that's wrong uh, because the reason we shoot time lapses uh, any time lapse uh, to get the highest possible quality you shoot that as a series of photos at a fixed interval so every you know two three or four seconds something tells the camera, be it an external remote or internally the software, tells the camera to trigger a photo. This is better for your battery life because you're not constantly recording. You're only shooting that one photo when you need it. You're shooting photos, much higher resolution than video. So even if you're shooting 4K video, uh, which is, you know, 12 megapixels, uh, any camera these days has, I've got, a, I've got a phone 108 megapixels. I made a, a 108 megapixel time-lapse from my phone shooting stills. And yes, it shoots 8K video, but then it's just churning through the battery and the storage. So that's another thing. Storage-wise, uh, you're just shooting still. It's like a still every couple of seconds as opposed to shooting high-resolution video. Then dynamic range, which you get when you're shooting raw photos or you're working with raw data. So there's all these reasons why a time-lapse is shot as a series of stills. And this is a great intro to the basics of time-lapse pretty much. So thanks for mentioning yeah. that. Yeah, no worries. And um, for time lapse itself, like, what kind of uh, work are you booked to do? Like, how are people using time lapse today? Anything and everything. Like, think of it, and I've shot it for a, a commercial or a campaign or something. I've shot construction. I've shot. I've been specifically booked in Australia once to shoot a hyperlapse of a wedding. Uh, so hyperlapse again is this niche within a niche where the time lapse is moving. Uh, yeah, the the groom was like obsessed with hyperlapse, so they booked me to do that. Uh, travel, uh, I've, I've shot warships coming in and out of, a, of Sydney Harbour for, uh, for a TV channel. I've shot scenic landscapes, uh, cityscapes, astro, you name it. There's, there's so much stuff. This technique applies to so many different things. It's mostly used in uh, 
think of TV show Breaking Bad, for example, is quite well known for its um, time lapse intermezzos, where they use it as a transitional shot. But it can be used for so much more than that. You know, music videos, art, uh, anything. Uh, I use time lapse. I, I mean, the the reason I love time lapse is because I love how it shows this hidden world around us. I, I always find it hard to put this into words, but we think we know what the world looks like. A friend of mine once said, he's like, oh, I actually didn't know that the clouds moved. And I, my mind was blown. I was like, what do you mean you didn't know clouds moved? So shoot stuff in a time lapse. It's the opposite of a slow motion shot. And it reveals this hidden world around us that we're not really aware of. So I'm obsessed with that technique. I'm obsessed with showing that to people. So, you know, social media for me is great because I can amplify what I see with hundreds of thousands of people. Um, yeah. So yeah, time lapse is used for, for so many things. And I've shot everything pretty much. So yeah, it's quite quite wide. It's more than just the yeah. transition uh, transition style shot. Sure. And should we jump into some of your work? Um, Let's do it. Yeah. Be, so yeah. I've I've updated my Behance with two projects. I think I'll just show the one because it's a nice mix of like travel filmmaking. Uh, this is in Western Australia about two years ago or a year and a half ago uh, for a tourism uh, tourism board. So this is a, a classic uh, come and create content for us that we can use on social media and in our ads and stuff. Uh, and I mixed, as I was shooting what I was there to shoot, I tried to shoot stuff on the side for my own channel. So I made this for myself. The other video you can check out later, it's like London footage. I've, I've been living here, came from Sydney. Well, before that I came from Antwerp in Belgium, but London for about a year. And then I made this time-lapse video. But I want to show you this uh, Australia's Golden Outback, which is what the region's called. Um, was there with two people, skeleton crew, create tourism content pretty much. And this is what I shot on the side. I wish I could dedicate all of my time and energy on what I wanted to shoot for my project, but I'm still very happy. So um, I just click play. Is that, does that work? Yeah, go for it. Cool. Do I full screen?
lit up a fire, a bushfire at night, which I spotted very vaguely with the naked eye, and then I pointed my camera towards it, and the camera picks up red light much better than our eyes. So that's a bushfire at night under a starry night sky in the Australian outback, which is one of my all-time favorite shots, and it's one of the shots we'll be editing today as well in Lightroom and After Effects. satellites flying around there's so many stars there that you just you can't see the constellations because they're just obscured by all the other stars and that's the lake the next day and then we try to go on it again but we didn't realize that it had been cooking since like early morning so the the lake bed was like a crispy layer of salt and then boiling hot almost liquid mud underneath and I was wearing flip-flops. And we kind of like got into a lot of trouble because it looks dry, but it's not. And the more we went in, the deeper we sank and then it was, yeah, it burned our feet. Um, I think there's some behind the scenes footage at the end where I'm just like, I've made a huge mistake. to sink in a little bit and then we realized that this is super super hot because obviously it's been yeah, you can watch that in the vlog i was vlogging at, at that time as well so that's uh yeah that's some of my travel work some of my time lapse some of my video work uh in okay. australia's golden outback made about two years ago looking at that thunderstorm oh my goodness and that sunset absolutely mm. beautiful and yeah. there were a lot of questions everybody loved the video by the way. Great. Everybody's lots of chatting about the video. Um, Sean just says, you know, love Matt's energy towards his work. Um, you know, talk to us about your kit. There were a few questions about what camera you use to capture the stars, mm -hmm. uh, the drone that you use. Yeah. Yeah. So kit. I mean, with travel, with time lapse, there's always a lot of gear involved. Um, I've got like an advanced kit which has motion control rails and you know a little spinning and panning heads. But I try to keep it basic because I'd rather have more footage that I can edit later on than just the one shot that, you know, costs much more time to set up and, and weighs you down more so you can't travel as, you know, you can't run and gun. I like run and gun shooting. So for that trip, I was there with three cameras, one 1DX Mark II, which is a camera that I bought four years ago because I wanted its video features. I wanted that slow-mo and the great autofocus and the low light performance. And that changed my career. I bought a camera that I didn't need but I grew into that, like a fish in a fish tank or whatever, you know, you grow with, with your gear pretty much. So 1DX Mark II with my favorite run and gun lens, which is a 2470 F4 lens, uh, obviously the Canon as well. The reason it's the F4 lens is because it has an image stabilizer on it, which is great for video and hyperlapse photography, which we'll hopefully talk about later. And it's got a built-in macro mode as well. So you can flick it to 70 mil and then all of a sudden you can shoot like, you know, super up close for details. And then for the time lapses, I had two 6D Mark IIs with me, um, which is a you know entry level full frame DSLR that Canon makes. That is an amazing value for money piece of kit. And then lens wise, I think I had a 24 millimeter 1.4, so that's quite a fast lens as we call it. It's got a large uh, aperture through which the low light uh, the light goes. Paired with good low light performance, you can really capture a lot of stars. But that being said. These days, you can shoot the Milky Way on your phone. A friend of mine back in Australia, um, on a new phone, he's like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna push this to the limits and see what happens." And obviously, it's not as great as a DSLR or like new mirrorless cameras, but it, um, it's mind blowing what sensors can pick up these days. So oh, yeah, yeah, DSLRs. I, I, I only have one mirrorless now, uh, which is a Lumix S1, which is great for time lapse as well. Uh, I've been using that a lot lately. But that video was fully shot on Canon with Canon glass. Uh, and then the drone, I think at the time was a Phantom, I want to say a Phantom 4 Pro. I had one on me, but I was mostly shooting video. And then my friend uh, Nick was shooting on the drone uh, on the lake while I was shooting all the other, other slow-mo stuff. And that's pretty much it. And then I travel, you know, I've got a little GoPro with me just for maybe the odd vlog stuff or a 360 camera when you're on a in a spot where you can create that content. Pretty much anywhere I go, 
I always bring a basic kit with me and a basic kit would be one camera, one lens and a remote and a little tripod so I can shoot a time-lapse wherever I am. But I shoot a lot of time-lapses yeah. on my phone as well. That's um, good. But yeah, that's yeah. the kit, that's that. Thank you, Matt. And, um, you know, Kirsty asks, how long have you been um, in time-lapse photography? I have been a full-time ti freelance time-lapse photographer for the last, I want to say eight years, but maybe it's seven. Seven to eight years. I've been playing around with it for almost a decade now, uh, but it, I committed to it as a, this is what I'm going to do now, uh, seven years ago when I moved to Australia. Long story short, I had a bad breakup in Belgium, went through some major depression, which at the time I didn't realize was depression, decided to clear my mind, traveled to Australia to go visit a friend on that trip, met a girl, and now we're here in London. That's the, <laughs> that's the long story yeah. short. But when I moved to Australia, I'd quit my job as a, I was fresh out of film school pretty much, I had a one year um, experience as a, as a video editor for an online educational company. And during that time I was playing with time-lapse and I always used to say, like, there's no way that I can make money with this because the nature of time-lapse is sitting around and waiting with expensive gear for hours on end and then go home and edit on expensive computers and make a video that's like 10 seconds long. Like all of that work, all of that kit, all of that travel and, and who's gonna pay for these 10 seconds? The thing is, there's no other way to create this kind of content. That's the way to do it. So you gotta find the right people that have the right vision with the right budget that allow you to go and shoot and create those things. And that's what happened when I moved yeah. to Australia. I got so far out of my comfort zone that I think it, it kicked me into something else. So I started networking and meeting people and showing them my work. And, and I've, I've got a whole presentation about how I network and how I came to where I am. But it's all about just meeting the right people. So going out and socializing, networking, showing uh, what <laughs> what you do and what you want to do. And then it's a yeah. numbers game, you know? You, you meet a hundred yeah. people out of those hundred people, someone's going to be able to give you something. And it's it's yeah. snowballed. It didn't hit the point where it just shot up. It was like one little job there for capturing some behind the scenes content and then this and that. And all of a sudden I, met, I had this realization out of nowhere. It's like, wow, I, for a few months now, have been making enough money to sustain myself from just time-lapse photography. And because it snowballed and it wasn't that, that click, I mean, it was a click, but it wasn't that hard change. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like surely this won't last. I'm just riding a wave of good luck and eventually it'll end. And seven years later, I still feel like I'm riding that wave and eventually I'm gonna get, you know, it's gonna stop. Obviously I've diversified since, diversified since then, which is very important. Something I talk about a lot as well. But yeah, I still kind of feel, and I, I, I know so many other creatives have that as well, it's the imposter syndrome where you don't think you deserve it or whatever, but the older I get, I'm about to turn 31, um, which is very young still, uh, the more I realize that it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not an imposter, I'm actually legitimately, you know, good at what I do and I need more of that uh, to, to put that outwardly as well. Definitely are. I mean, the work that we saw there in that uh, Australian video was just amazing. Um, Thank you. And, you know, that people are asking in the chat, I know Jackie said, you know, where is that networking presentation? Um, people do want to hear more from you. And I know, Matt, you said that you do have some assets, actually, or some, um, is it uh, e-books, online books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, I've, last year I wrote two e-books about uh, time-lapse photography, uh, which is now sold as a bundle. So that's everything you need to know about time-lapse, uh, much more than we'll be able to go over today. It's all in there. Uh, it's on my website. I think it's linked somewhere. And then the other e-book is called Passive Income for Creatives, which I recently dropped down in price to see if that sells better. And apparently it does. Uh, but the Passive Income for Creatives e-book is all about how to monetize your hobby. If you have a hobby that you're passionate about, that you know about, you could be a designer, illustrator, photographer, baker. You could be into Italian food or classic cars or vegan, like anything. As long as you're passionate about it and you want to put in the effort, this book is like a, a guideline to how to monetize in a passive way so that you can focus more on creating stuff and have everything running in the back. Uh, like this morning I woke up and I, you know, I sold an ebook and I was in Italy last week. I took some time off uh, and I sold a bunch and it's, it's this system and it teaches you how to set up the system uh, so you can make money with your hobby, which is pretty fun. So thanks for mentioning that. Really appreciate that I can plug yeah. my latest ebook here. No, there's demand. I mean, as I said, yeah. you know, uh, people in our chat are asking. Um, and there is a, a question from Angus as well about the video that you showed us. How long did it take to film, you know, from start to finish on that project? Um, yeah, how long? To film, that? it was, oh, let me, I think we were traveling 
for about two weeks or maybe just just less than two weeks and the so what we actually made wasn't shown in this at all um it was like a tourism campaign because it's australia is a huge country it's got on the west southwest coast it's got perth which is one of the most isolated uh, cities in the world and then six a six hour drive east inland from perth is kalgoorlie which is a mining town and around kalgoorlie is the region called the golden outback and the tourism board for the golden outback needed some fresh content to promote tourism to their area uh, because a lot of their economy comes from mining and they tried to you know get more people to come visit because the history of that region is a gold mining history is a gold rush just like what happened in the us um or, or you know so many other places in the world so they uh, flew us in to come document these old abandoned mining towns and it's like a little ghost town and have a look at this the biggest gold mine in the world uh this these lakes and these art installations and stuff so very little of what, what i was there for was actually shown in this but yeah two weeks of travel there capturing literally from morning from sunrise till late at night to get the astro a couple hours of sleep and then driving in the day and then hitting this town and shooting content there and it was quite a a challenge for me that project because the brief was very much instagram so my point of view when i'm shooting be it a time lapse or like just you know nice cinematic stuff i'm always thinking widescreen compositions aspect ratios wide and this was all instagram so i had to think very straight on level the camera square and that was so different for me but was, as soon as i got into it it was like all right let's find a composition that's just square straight on follow with a gimbal follow this person walking in the middle you know tiny person in a landscape um but yeah about two weeks of shooting and then weeks and weeks of editing weeks and weeks and weeks wow yeah you mentioned that you need to have a good relationship with the people that give you the briefs so that they understand mm -hmm. the time it takes to produce something like that definitely definitely they need to understand the, the time that goes into it so now if i'm coding yeah. for a job that's time lapse related mm -hmm. i need to figure out if the person that i'm talking to actually understands what it is there's been a job a couple of years ago where i was asked to make um, a, a backdrop for a website like a looping cinemagraph pretty much of a of their beachfront at sunrise but they asked me if i could do time lapse and it took me a full meeting to understand that they actually wanted a slow motion <laughs> cinemagraph <laughs> and then i'd already kind of started you know creating this concept and then we we made it a time lapse slash a slow motion mix which blended multiple shots from multiple days and um but yeah a lot of people that's why i started this talk about time lapses photos turn into video it's not video sped up because it changes the way you shoot yeah. it changes what you can do as well but there's still a big you know, I'm so deep in this time lapse bubble. Step out of that, and people have no idea what it is or how it's made. Uh, so it's really fun. So yeah, you need to educate yeah. people a little bit about what that all is. No, definitely. And do you think, um, you know, quarantine and things like that we've had in the UK has changed the way that you're creating these days, or are you still? I, I went hard on the tutorial content uh, on my YouTube channel because I was like, I've been shooting for you know so long, and I have this footage that I never got around to to sharing. So. I thought about uh, what can I do? I can't leave, like you, we weren't allowed to leave the house. So I took that to just, you know, double down on tutorials. And I love, I love teaching people because what I get out of that is a loyal follower, someone that likes what I give them for free. Mm. Pretty much everything I teach in my eBooks about time lapse, you can find on my YouTube channel, but you just got to go through 600 uploads <laughs> and, you know, filter out all the other noise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, teaching people, I love doing, you know, talks and presentations and live streams like this because you teach people a new skill and they can go on and monetize that mm. in their own way and, and maybe form yeah. a career out of that. And I've seen that happen quite a lot of times. And that's just, you yeah. know, I think a lot of people have this fear of, of dying and not having made an impact. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm leaving this world a better place. I'd like to, obviously, but I've definitely taught people a lot and people are very grateful for that. And I'm very grateful to have that platform to do that. So, yeah, yeah. I think it's a win-win for everyone. It definitely is. And I think one of the things that have come, you know, come out of Adobe Live is that we're watching our creatives processes. And that is teaching us all so many new skills. Um, and today you're going to take us into part of your Australian movie that you made. And you're going to show us how you edited a part of that, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, like, how long have we been chatting? I'm like, I can keep chatting for 20, hours. 25 minutes, minutes, but it all feels right. five. It, it, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I feel guilty because I was like, I've, I've prepped, uh, you know, tutorial kind of or, or some kind yeah. of tutorial at least so let's go let's go over the basics of time lapse so we've talked about how you shoot it as a series of photos and i'm going to show you how i edit a series of photos in lightroom into a video file using after effects or 
and Photoshop as well. But I'll show you my workflow. So first up, you need um, you need content, right? So this is that Astro sequence that I shot in um, the Outback. This is what the JPEG looks like. Um, it's very dark. Uh, the raw file, I shoot raw and JPEG at the same time. It's a bit more flat, it's a bit less contrasty, but pretty much you offload your memory card data onto a hard drive, and then you import all that into Lightroom. So I'm just going to drag this folder into Lightroom and make sure it's on add, because I organize the files in the Explorer in the Finder myself, because I have my own file organization system. So I don't um, import JPEGs and RAW separately, and I'll explain why later. Pretty much I'm just going to import these 530 photos, these 530 or 529 RAW files. I'm just gonna save all that. Um, import them in here. Address lookup is off, yes, I know. I told you not to, that's good. Um, and file naming and organization is very, very important because I have shot thousands and thousands of sequences over the years, but I have a system. I've got a, a, a spreadsheet with the names and the locations and the dates of everything. Uh, the, and if I get a licensing inquiry from, you know, an ad agency or a, a film production company that wants to use, like for example, this footage I had to remaster recently um, because someone wanted to use that potentially in a documentary. And I didn't have the original footage, but I have that original footage on a NAS connected to the internet back in Sydney. Um, so here in London, I can just log in and go into my spreadsheet. And I was like, that file is in that folder in that partition of the drive, pretty wow. much. Um, very efficient. And then I just got to download Dang. the internet. Sadly, the internet in Australia, um, if we have any Aussies in the chat, is so bad. <laughs> so that kind of stuff takes forever, <laughs> especially because you're shooting raw files. The, the amount of data you generate with time-lapse photography is a little bit ridiculous. So just this one sequence is 13 gigabytes, which I consider very, very normal um, for just one shot. And then on a trip like that, oh, how much was it? I think I made, I don't know, could have been a couple terabytes worth of content. Wow. Pretty crazy. Anyway, it's fetching initial previews. I'm not sure if I have to do that, but yeah, this is the sequence. It's clean from beginning to end. So it's this, it's a static exposure. I haven't changed the settings. It's what I call a basic time-lapse, even though this is an astro shot. It's the exact same principle of shooting as a daytime shot where you don't change any settings. There's then the advanced holy grail time-lapse shot where you have to change your settings as you go, or you got to tell the camera to do that because the sun is setting or the sun is rising. And obviously it's going to be under or overexposed. Now I don't have too many presets. Um, I just have this raw to JPEG converter preset that I made, which adds, as you can see, a little bit of contrast here, drops the highlights, shadows, Whites and blacks, I'm actually just gonna put those to zero. And then vibrance and saturation, I usually just kind of up like that. I don't touch these um, sliders. And I think same with the whites and the blacks is because they're non-linear edits. If I add exposure to this, I'm adding exposure to the entire image. But working with the clarity slider, even though it makes it look more, you know, punchy or crunchy <laughs> in this case, uh, these are applied differently per photo. So if these clouds move, it'll apply that effect in a different way and that'll lead in the end result to a sort of a flickering video and flickering is the last thing you want in a time-lapse. So yeah. the majority of my edits are very basic and I try to keep them as close to real life as possible because that's what it is. I just, I don't have to edit a lot because what I shoot is already so special. Like a night sky looks yeah. fantastic as it is if you shoot it obviously with a, with a wildfire in a very dark spot. So it's I might amazing. just add a bit of contrast, maybe a bit more saturation. And honestly, it doesn't really need much more. You can add a gradient uh, if I wanna like drop the exposure a little bit here at the bottom, because like maybe those, those highlights are a bit blown out and then you can drop the highlights a little bit just to keep it all, you know, keep it all natural. But that's pretty much all I would do is like very basic edits. And then what I do, um, I do shift command C or let me just quickly go here photo develop settings copy settings or you can use sync settings they're both kind of the same uh, and you copy everything that you've edited on that photo you can just check all and then you select the rest and then you do shift command V and then it's as you can see at the top here it's pasting these settings that's another misconception that people are like oh wow you got to edit all these photos 
you gotta edit thousands of photos. I'm like, nah, we have intelligent software for that. that is good. So you can just sync that, edit, and because it's all the same settings, it'll all kind of look the same. Let that run for a bit. I'm not sure why it's so slow right now, but I think my computer's um, taxed because it's hot. <laughs> oh yeah, probably. And look, Matt, talk to us. Talk us a little bit more about that Excel spreadsheet that you spoke of, or it might not be Excel, but um, organization is a huge thing. Um, and yeah. we've had a regular um, creative one called Joe, who we normally have a session called "What Would Joe Do," and he always talks about organization. And you've, is this you've Alan? exactly, yeah, Joe Allen, yeah. yeah. Love and Joe. He, if he's watching, he probably, hi Joe. <laughs> <laughs> he probably is. And um, you know, for organization, I know Jackie asked a question in the chat. What does that look like? Like what information do you put in that so that you know where to find what? Like what kind of things? Good, have? good question. Uh, and I appreciate that question as well because it shows that you realize the importance of this. Um, so for example, this is a this is a very bad uh, ooh, can I zoom? Yeah. Astro dash raw is not how I usually do it. How I usually do it is I there's a little app that I've made a preset for, um, and I would create a project like that. And what this does is it generates a folder structure within seconds, as you just saw, let me move that out of the way. So this test now has today's date, the project name that I just gave it, and in that has these three folders with the date and the blah, 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 the name and everything. In project files, go your After Effects project file, uh, you know, uh, Premiere Lightroom catalog. In renders, your finished results, and in raw, go, goes like all your um, your folders. So when I import a memory card into the raw folder, I will just drag all the contents in there. Then I drag all the contents into Lightroom and then I go and rename these. I can't do it now because it's facing settings, but then I rename every sequence. So I create uh, folders in camera or I separate them in Lightroom. And then the uh, shot name gets added to that project name as well. So every folder that contains the time lapse has the date of creation, the project name, which usually is the location uh, or the client, and then separately has the shot name as well. So this one was called originally Kukaini, which was the location of that hotel that we were shooting at, fire wide dash raw. And then there's the JPEG folder as well. So just in the folder name for every single shot, I have context as far as uh, date, location, and shot. So if I get asked um, by a potential client, do you have any uh, Australian bushfire stuff? Like immediately I like, oh yeah, I had a shot there, but ooh, where was it? And then I can just go to the root folder. And because I've generated this, temp using this template, I've generated all my projects for the last five years, I think, since I dialed it down. I know it's gonna be in that raw folder. I know it's going to be in the time-lapse folder and in that time-lapse folder, I just have to look at the name. And now I've also listed on which hard drive uh, all these projects are. So yeah, what do you put in there? The date. And because I'm a bit of a social media freak, I share so much on social media. I can be like, oh, where was that shot? And I'm like, oh, upload date. It was around that. So I can put in the month, the year and the month of when I uploaded it to go and find the folder. And in that spreadsheet, I have uh, each project. So say the root uh, name of the project. As I made, I made one today. Uh, yeah, like Adobe Stream would be kind of Adobe Stream. I should have used the the way I usually do it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's all in that spreadsheet with the, the name of the project and then the hard drive that it's on and which hard drive that it's backed up on. Because children, if you have your content or your data only on one hard drive, it might as well be gone because every single hard drive in the world will fail at some point. So please. Yeah. Back up your footage. That is a good point. And Kirsty does ask, what software do you use to generate the folder structure? It's called Post Haste and it's free and I use it all the time. Uh, so you generate these templates. I've generated this, the basic time-lapse or the pro time-lapse template. Um, but pretty much this template name here, the word template gets replaced with the path that I put in here. So the word template will get replaced with the date and the project name. And this is from this year. So I've done 36 projects already this year, which is quite a lot. And then editor, I think that's external metadata that gets added. And here you get a little preview as to what um, what the project's gonna be called. And here I, yeah, you generate that folder structure. I think this is, I made a preset and that's included in my time-lapse eBooks. Um, but yeah, this is a, a great way 
for example, if you are a visual effects artist, this is all the, the standard stuff that's included. So you renders, texture, textures, after effects, exports, blah, blah, blah. These are all just like basic folder structures that are automatically generated using this little app called Post Haste, uh, which I was taught about in film school, I think, years and years ago. Perfect timing. Nice. <laughs> These settings have now been pasted. So Yay. now we have a sequence of raw files. And we'll go in uh, the raw folder here. Nothing's changed here uh, and actually organized as they were on the card. I have the raw file straight out of camera that still looks dark and the JPEG, which is what the JPEG looked like straight out of camera. But the, there's the settings that have been added to all these photos. So how do I get the, the software? Because Lightroom doesn't generate video files. It can create, um, what do you call it? Um, slideshows, but they don't play back at the right frame rate. So we're gonna need Photoshop or After Effects to create the video file from these series of photos, but they need to be able to know what I've changed, right? So you just select all your photos and then go to metadata and then save metadata to files or just hit Command S or Control S and then it's saving them. And if you then go into your file, uh, Explorer or your old folder, you'll see that it's adding these XMP files. And if you're not familiar with XMP files, they're literally, if you open that with a oops, text editor, they are a uh, text-based metadata display. You can go here, example, uh, exposure time. So it's got all your EXIF data in there. But if you go further down, I think CRS stands for camera raw, maybe camera raw software. Uh, it says tint plus 28, saturation plus 20, sharpness 40, all these things. So it's a it's a text-based editing display of what I just did in Lightroom. And this is the file that After Effects is about to read when I'm going to create this video file. So it's gonna take the raw files, apply the XMP metadata on top of that, and then we're gonna create a video file out of that. And let's wow. do that. While and, we're it's, at it. and it's good that you mentioned that this your next step would either be After Effects or Photoshop because you'd automatically yeah. think After Effects. I would probably think Premiere Pro actually, but um, it's surprising yeah. to hear Photoshop. So I'm keen to see what you're. Yeah, so like. Premiere, because I'm so used to the workflow, because the majority of my time lapse work is shooting time lapses, making time lapse files. And the most efficient way to do that is, in my opinion, there's deep, people that do it differently, is um, Lightroom and After Effects. So this is a fresh After Effects project. Um, I know After Effects, and that's why we'll talk about Photoshop as well, is very daunting at first if you're new to it. And I remember the first time I opened After Effects years ago, I was like, ooh, I don't know anything. But it's like any Adobe software, and that's the beauty of having the you know creative suite is it, controls are the same, you know? You've got um, effects and presets and the way parameters work and the way keyframes work and everything and animating. It's all, it's all in the same family. So what I do here is in this fresh After Effects project, I just go to this Astro Raw folder. And because there is a sequential folder in here, you know, 6298, 6299, this is all sequential. I literally just drag that folder in here into the uh, project window. And look at that. It has read the XMP settings and apply that to the photo is asking me, do you want to adjust anything? No, nope. just import it as it is. And boom, this is an image sequence. So this little logo here or this icon means that it is a sequence that has been interpreted at 25 frames per second. So now all I got to do is create a composition from the selection, the selection being an image sequence. This new composition that I make takes on all the characters, the aspect ratio, resolution, etc., of the sequence that I just loaded in there. I've got it on quarter resolution preview just because it's slow to read raw files. Because a raw file, in case you're not familiar, is a 14-bit uh, piece of data as opposed to a JPEG, which is 8-bit and small, and it's easy to read. And that's why I shoot both raws and JPEGs at the same time. If I want to do a quick preview render of an image sequence, I'll just render the JPEG real quick, which flies through it. But rendering a raw file, I usually let that run overnight and let my computer run thousands um, in a batch because uh, it just yeah. takes forever. Anyways, I then would take this file name, and again, organization is key, and drag those in a little folder, because the years later, I might revisit this After Effects project and want to remaster, which I had to recently do, 
uh, this one shot. And then again, all these folders have the same folder names or file names as the ones uh, that are on the hard drive. So if we have a look at the composition settings, we have 5,000, et cetera, pixels wide and high. Uh, I just make a new comp from that. And then this one I can edit into whatever it is that I want. Ultra HD, 4K at 25 frames a second. Adjust your scale to 71% just fits in. If you want to, you know, make it a, already a 16 by nine or a widescreen aspect ratio. And then control command M, boom. And then you put your Quite. export location and your codec. I usually use uh, QuickTime ProRes 42 HQ, but you can make that whatever you want. Um, the reason I use After Effects is because now, instead of going render queue, I can also send that to the Adobe Media Encoder queue and then just like batch it through there as it's running in the back while I'm still editing in After Effects. As soon as you start your render in After Effects, the app or the software kind of shuts down and that's all it's going to be doing. Yeah. Um, but if you have a really powerful computer, you can have it render in the back and keep working in After Effects, which is quite, uh, quite useful. So here, Media Encoder, I'm sure it's going to update in a sec. Uh, with this sequence. And then so, there's that. So Sean asks, sorry to jump in, uh, why not export the photos? Great question. And I used to do that. I used to export from uh, Lightroom, from the RAWs to JPEGs to then have a, you know, lightweight JPEG to edit with. The reason you don't do that is because a RAW file, as I mentioned earlier, is 14 bits. So it's uh, bit depth is, uh, I don't know how many colors you get with, with that, but the JPEG is only eight bits. Uh, so if you have a sunset, for example, where uh, there's a gradient in the sky with an 8-bit JPEG, you'll see banding because it doesn't have enough different colors yeah. to display all that beautiful gradient. So if you go from a 14-bit RAW file to an 8-bit JPEG to then export to a video, which might be a 12-bit ProRes or I think ProRes is 10-bit, I'm not sure, uh, you just lose quality. It's like uh, mm -hmm. compressing something and then trying to make it, upscaling it, you'll get yeah. pixelizations it's kind of a similar thing and it took me a while to figure that out because initially my first workflow was raw to jpeg to video and then i looked more into it and it's like oh wow you've been losing quality for years because you had this intermediary step also it's a extra step to process to a jpeg and then to a video here you retain the highest possible quality and you can batch export overnight while you're sleeping and your computer is like a thousand degrees hot <laughs> um so that's why I don't export the photos. There are other workflows where you go from raw to TIFF to the ProRes file. But again, my preferred way and the way that it works ideally for me because I do so much travel, I don't always have the time to take that extra step. But that extra step you know, means you can stabilize easier because a TIFF file is easier to read than a raw file. Um, the bunch of reasons that you know are a bit too in-depth to, to go into right now, but pretty much that's After Effects. Now, there's the Adobe Photo Pack that a lot of people have where you get a subscription for Lightroom and Photoshop, um, which, you know, obviously doesn't come with After Effects. So let's have a look at how you can create a video file from a sequence of photos using Photoshop, which if you haven't done this before, I'm about to blow your mind and how easy this is. So I'm going to uh, go to File, Open, Movies, Go to that raw folder, Astro Raw. Select the first raw image. Mm, that's annoying, that's supposed to say. Hmm. Usually I can select the image sequence. Anyways, let's work with the JPEGs for now. This is where you would do an intermediary step, go from raw to a JPEG or a TIFF. If I now click image sequence, Photoshop's gonna open all of these JPEGs sequentially into a, as a video file. And you can set your frame rate here anything you want. I just use 25 because that's the country we live in here, 25 frames based on 50 Hertz wall power. And here's a video group you see on the side, that's your layer. You can now add a crop or whatever you want. You can add extra effects, blah, blah, blah. But pretty much you now go export render video. And then you can adjust some settings such as, uh, you know, file name, who's going to render it, Adobe Media Encoder or Photoshop Image Sequence. You just go with Media Encoder because that's more efficient. You can choose your uh, codecs and your presets, your sizes, frame rates, everything. And if I now hit render, it's going to render a video file. 
the same Mine's way that After Effects would have done that. So if you have <laughs> the photo pack of Lightroom and Photoshop, you can make high quality time lapses. Uh, it's just a slightly different workflow. Uh, and this workflow is covered in my free ebook, The Basics of Time Lapse. Quick little plug here, uh, which yeah explains to you the basics of time lapse, how to shoot, the plan, shoot, and process uh, basic time lapse footage. So boom, there you have it. Time lapse made with Photoshop. Now I wow. still have some time, right? Yeah, forty-five minutes. And if anyone has questions for Matt, please get them into Behance. Uh, Behance.net forward slash live. Oh, what did I say? Ten. We've got fifteen minutes. Sorry. <laughs> I was like another forty-five. That's fine. Work. I can keep going. <laughs> um, one time I did a full day time lapse workshop. I couldn't talk anymore at the end. I was like, oh, I'm done. Yeah. But um, so I mentioned uh, hyperlapse earlier. Hyperlapse is something that was done for the first time decades ago, but it didn't become a thing until I want to say 2011 is when it first kind of popped up on the internet on Vimeo by this Russian guy called Zwei And I saw that. And just as the first time I saw a time lapse uh, video that blew my mind, I saw this hyperlapse video because I knew what time lapse was. I didn't know what I was looking at when I saw this hyperlapse for the first time. And I was just like, uh, what? <laughs> What's going on? Um, so I'll show you what it looks like. Um, this is an example of a hyperlapse shot on that same Western Australia trip. So it's this ultra smooth, moving, high resolution uh, time lapse that kind of makes things look 3D in a 2D medium, uh, which is really, really fun. Um, and it's shot the same way as the time lapse, except for every photo that you take, you click it and then you move and then you click another photo and then you move again. And then that's the, the manual way of, of shooting a hyperlapse. Um, and they are so simple, but people overcomplicate it in their minds and they're shooting and they're like, no, oh, it's, and, and there's so many people that fail because they overthink it. It's very, very simple. How to shoot a hyperlapse, take your camera and I've shot this on my phone, I've shot it on a drone, I've shot it from a plane, from a heli, you name it. I've got a playlist about hyperlapse on my uh, YouTube channel with 10 tutorials, 10 different ways to do it. But the way you do it is you have a camera, put all your settings on manual, just like a basic time lapse, keep your camera level, choose a subject, and find a line to follow, be it sideways or an arch or uh, straightforward. Sideways is easiest. And keep one element in the exact same spot for every single photo. And from memory, let me see what I did here. I think this little dot or something there uh, on that building is what I kept in the exact same spot. And then just like, um, before you're just going to drag that in After Effects and then add a stabilizer. This is what it looks like straight out of camera, by the way. Very jumpy. <laughs> but this was shot on yeah. the street, so I had to be quick. So it's not as steady as I usually shoot. But uh, the way you edit that, and this is just so much fun because you can, uh, here's some other examples, by the way, uh, all from this mining town. They've got some crazy architecture. And with the first photo that you had, um, because this is a moving, time lapse mm -hmm. do you find that you've got to edit like like when you, you had like an intersection there with traffic and so you'd have cars moving and the cars would be in different places as you go right so yeah. do you have to edit those out i mean are you taking them depends like that shot i had to reshoot because the client was like oh there's too many cars so then we went back at sunrise which is like 4 30 so it was a you know it was a very tiring trip um but yeah you can edit them out frame by frame uh mm -hmm. with a time lapse if there's birds and stuff it's actually quite easy to just paste them out uh with a car when it's part of, you know, it's quite difficult. Um, I was at Adobe Max, when was it last year? No, I think two years ago when they showed the video, um, what do you call yeah. it? Like clone stamp, uh, the awareness fill tool for video where yeah. they just like remove the lamppost. And I was, I, I was doing posts on my Instagram stories at the time. And I think you can hear me say like, oh my God. <laughs> Cause I was like, oh, this changes, changes everything. But I haven't gotten around to fully playing with it yet. Um, to, you know, maybe you can use that to, to remove cars or elements from stuff like that. But um, the way you make a shot like that, so these are all the JPEGs. I might, oh, maybe I'm trying to figure out how in depth I go. But yeah, there's a JPEG sequence and a raw sequence. What I would do in this case is separate the JPEGs into a separate folder. 
and I call that folder hyperlapse. Oops, hyperlapse JPEG. They're the same file name. They're the same photo, same resolution, same everything, right? So I import that into After Effects, create a new comp, and then you just drag the warp stabilizer on there. You set this smoothness to 10% and you let that analyze in the back. At the same time, you can import the raw file or these raw photos into your Lightroom catalog and start color grading them. Because otherwise you gotta wait for it to stabilize, you gotta wait for the color grade to get added, you gotta wait for it okay. to be exported. Now the computer in the back is stabilizing the sequence and at the same time we're color grading them. Um, I'm not sure why that's not getting imported. And then, um, and talk to us about Kit again, um, because I know Oliver mentioned, uh, is that a handheld or moving a tripod about the hyperlapse? There's so yeah. many different ways that you can shoot a hyperlapse. Um, I know a lot of people, they get amazing results on a tripod with a, a geared ball head, and then you can use a filter and have long exposures. But my preferred way is, again, to run and gun, because I can create so many more sequences like that. I'm also, I've been doing this for a very long time. And it's literally how I got my visa in Australia with a, it was a distinguished talent, a permanent residency distinguished talent visa. Uh, there's only 200 of those a year in Australia. Uh, so I applied for that. I was like, what's my distinguished talent? Hyperlapse. And I showed like all my media appearances and stuff I've done. And it's so niche, so unique. Um, and I'm just like, you know, I, I can talk about this because I, I am kind of an authority on it, but, um, Handheld for me is the way to go because I can bang out so many more sequences than my colleagues that take three, four times as long. I used to do a lot of festival work where I would, um, there's one time there was a, a guy on a tripod and he was doing the classic way. And yes, his footage looked slightly more cinematic because he had motion blur in there, but I delivered, I think, three or four times as many clips. And I'm like, you know, that's valuable. The clips are still mind-blowingly very impressive and very cool. Um, but yeah, so handheld. So literally, if this is the camera, I would, um, I'm not going to stand up because I'm wearing short, short shorts because it's so hot today. But yeah, you click, <laughs> move, click, move. And then people think like, oh, but what about the interval or the timing? The sequence is going to play back at 25 frames per second. So if one of those 25 frames is slightly off, if it's got a four second interval between photo and a two second on the next one, it kind of evens out. People won't really be noticing those fine details unless you're like really going off like one second, then it takes you seven seconds to shoot the next one. That's when it will look a bit jittery or a bit jumpy. Um, but yeah, it's about getting in the zone and kind of, it becomes this like Zen trance style. Like you just step, step and you're framing as you go. And that's why I mentioned that lens at the start, the 2470, yeah. an image stabilizer or a sensor that stabilized really helps you to keep that one little spot in the same spot. And I often mm -hmm. use my camera grid for that or a focus point that's visible as you're shooting to just put it on the corner of a building or put it on a, on a window or something or a little cross or whatever. Um, that's how you keep that reference point the same and then keep your camera level. And then you'll see in After Effects, this is still analyzing because I've got so many apps open. There's only so much RAM you can throw at it. Um, it'll use that point that's almost always the same with the advanced, you know, stabilizing algorithm and it'll just make it so clean and smooth. Um, like you saw that straight out of camera um, yeah. <laughs> hyperlapse, which looks so jittery and, and wonky. Um, and I think this was like with one run of stabilizing, the warp stabilizer in After Effects made that, took that and turned it into that. Yeah. And it's just so much fun. And then you can go, you know, shoot advanced ones where it goes from day to night. I recently shot a campaign for a big tech brand in uh, San Fran where we shot stuff like that from a helicopter around, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge. And, and yeah, it's it's so much fun. And it's showing it's this, you know, it's still a new technique. I talked about the time lapse bubble mm. earlier. Like I'm so far into that to me, it's normal. But show someone that hasn't seen a hyperlapse, a hyperlapse, and they're going to be like, yeah. what is that? <laughs> so it's good. And, you know, Oliver says, uh, good to know that there's no specialist kit needed. I'm going to give this a go. Um, and Pick up that playlist. It literally, I've shot it on my phone. I've shot it on GoPros. Yeah. I've shot it on mini cameras. You can shoot it on anything. As long as you can kind of lock your settings so there's no mm -hmm. flickering and exposure and brightness, you're good to go. 
There's also a hashtag starting in the chat for bring back Matt. So um, you're definitely going to have to come it. back and carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll slow down so I have stuff to talk about next time. Um, oh, no. Yeah, no, it's 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 so fun. And I think, yeah, time lapse, I got obsessed with it because that first time lapse video I saw, I was still in film school, and it showed like clouds moving and fog moving in a valley and stars. And I was like, I know what these things are, but I had no idea that fog in a valley moves like liquid waves when you mm -hmm. show it in a time lapse. Or that certain clouds, you think they're moving very slowly, but they're actually not moving at all. They're staying static yeah. and they're regenerating on the spot from heat generated from the city. I, I should, one of the first times I saw that was a couple of weeks ago when I was, I was shooting with Joe Allen, actually. Uh, I shot a quick time lapse before he arrived as I was waiting for him. And I dial in my settings like three seconds per photo because that's what I usually shoot for clouds. And I thought like, oh, these clouds really aren't moving. And then I hit play on the, on the sequence and I was just like, I have never seen that before. It was like a boiling, it was like it was boiling, but it was straight up above and the clouds were moving, but you just couldn't see it because they were static. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it, such a fun technique to, to discover and our world so from a different perspective. Yeah. It, it does. And, you know, from capturing that lightning storm and the sunset, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, talk to us then. I know that we've only got about five minutes left now. Um, if you would start a project and you, you know, you, you've given a brief um, to create something, how do you begin? What do you do? How do you plan it? Um, what kind of projects? Like, uh, could be um, another like thing I've done is actually I could. Okay, yeah. So that oh, to me one. is that edit was generated, and this doesn't sound very professional, but that was created after the fact because I'm there in this insane location that I'm 99% sure that I'll never visit again. So what do I shoot? I shoot according to the brief, obviously, uh, which was the Instagram square, you know, straight on stuff. Um, but also like for my own stuff, just shoot as much as possible. Shoot everything, everything. <laughs> That's why I've got three cameras and a drone and everything with me because I can set them up and they're running. And, and then after the fact, I'll be like, okay, how am I going to start this? And I look at all the footage I have and I've got some great Astro stuff. I've got a bushfire at night, I've got some storm. Let's start quiet. Oh no, let's start with a storm. And it's just puzzling. And that's, I'm an editor by trade. I went to film school as a, as a video film editor. Um, it's just puzzling. And slowly but surely you swap things around and things fall into place and you kind of, like I always have a reason to put something somewhere. Like I can, I can like, I put that shot there because X, Y, Z. Uh, and that's the puzzling. It's coming up with those reasons like why the shot fits there. Um, there's other time-lapse projects as well uh, that I've specialized in and they're extremely fast turnaround projects. Like within 24 hours, you, the shoot starts and 24 hours later, the, the project's done. I've done this for tourism uh, boards in Australia where it's like a, f a food and wine festival, for example. They wanted to show a time-lapse video of the start of this food and wine festival on the Saturday. And we shot everything on the Friday and then into Friday night. Or like Chinese New Year, I've done that for Tourism Sydney. And the way you go about that is you literally prepare the edit in advance. So you find your music in advance, you get that signed off by the client. You're like, and you, it's very straightforward and, and basic cutting to the beat, but like we need an establishing intro shot that shows the city of Sydney. Then we need to show that we're going in tonight. So we need a sunset shot. And some of that you can shoot in advance or you can use footage that you have from the past. And then it's very useful that you can go through your spreadsheet and find your old footage. And then you just puzzle it together. And then on the night, we this is a different project. We had to shoot uh, 12 big lanterns uh, you know, the, the Zodiac signs. Um, and then you shoot like, all right, I need three shots of every lantern. So you find three angles and then you create the time-lapse footage as fast as you can, or you create it in camera. Uh, and that means you've got to shoot it in a different way because you won't have time to go through After Effects and Lightroom. And then you just fill in these puzzle pieces and you've, you've prepped the edit beforehand and then you send it over for review and they're like, oh, can you just swap those shots or can you remove that or can you add this? One feedback round and boom, in the morning, it's been on TV and in the media, like, wow, oh, City of Sydney, uh, Chinese or Lunar New Year Lantern Festival has started. And there's this finished, polished time-lapse video on TV. And everyone's like, is this old footage or it's like, no, no, we just... And so for those projects, I think people that are into production and into time-lapse, I hired someone out of my own budget to assist me and to film me 
to document that project because I find it so fascinating to see how other people tackle them. So it's a series on my YouTube channel called Production Vlogs or Time Lapse Production Vlogs, where I take you with me and I talk you through how I prep, how I pack, how I shoot, how I edit, what goes wrong. Because the last time I did one of those projects, everything went wrong. We had crazy rain and wind, which isn't great for a tourism ad. One of my cameras malfunctioned for the first time ever. Mm. Uh, there was fireworks, which was super time critical and location critical because we had location scouted. We were told the barge with the fireworks is going to be there behind the Sydney Opera House. So you frame it up 10 minutes into the thing. I can't call the tourism contact liaison. The barge isn't there. I don't know where this fireworks is going to happen. You're running around. Everything went wrong, but you still made, you know, through prep work and, and having yeah. backup plans, we still made a fun video. So. Yeah, I, wow. I document my, my work and, and in the hopes to teach people or entertain people at least um, on my YouTube channel. Oh, definitely. And, you know, Stuart has just said the, the best comment to start wrapping this up, which is, man, the skills you get from shadowing or working with Matt would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, Kirsty says, wow, amazing. Um, Matt, you definitely have to come back. Um, I'd love to be back. It would be really good to cover some more of your work. And Tim has shared that your link to Behance in the chat today also links to the ebooks that you have as well. Thank um, you so and much. It's it's been so good having you. Like honestly, it feels like we've been chatting for ten minutes. And I know, been... right? It's already done. And great oh. timing if you look at the uh, After Effects screen. Oh, yeah. The uh, stabilization's done, and it's about yeah. to complete the RAM preview. And that's just one run of stabilizing. Turned it into. Great timing. Whoops, sorry, I hit the wrong button. That's it. So from that really shaky shot to just that, Seamless. with one one warp stabilizer added. And that's it. Amazing. Well, it, it looks so good. I know that Tim has shared more links in the chat. Um, to everybody, we're here all week from midday till 1 p.m. We've got some other uh, great Adobe Live sessions tuned in for you. Uh, you know, Make sure you tune in, I should say. Um, and again, thank you, Matt. Um, thank definitely you. Definitely come back. And we'll see you all again soon. Bye, Thanks everybody. so much. Thanks for having me. Bye.